True Crime Page Podcast featuring Scott Williams, Carlyons, 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 Carlyons. Hello and welcome to the True Crime Page podcast. I'm your host Scott Williams Collier. Today we're going to cover the story of a notorious brutal double murder of lifelong friends Anne Carrier and Elizabeth Christine Blood, which took place in Scholar Green near Congleton way back in 1979. The case became better known as the Boarded Barn Murders. The victims were middle class housewives with successful husbands and children in private schools. Um, they like to host coffee mornings for friends, like gardening and growing roses, and like to browse through antique shops. They were pillars of country society and were keen horse women who rode in the local hunt. Christine Blood was married to a wealthy estate agent and kept two thoroughbred horses in paddocks at her home. She was a mother of three children and she was well known for her charity work in the area. She also liked to help with pony riding for disabled children. Anne Carrier was keenly involved with her local Conservative Party and rode with the North Staffordshire Hunt. Uh, She was married to a a director of a successful pottery company in Stoke-on-Trent. The two women had been friends since their school days. Now... Their backgrounds could not have been different from the three young thugs that would sadly brutalise and take their lives in a senseless murder. A double murder that would shock the country. Stephen Anderson, Philip Jennings and Paul Hebel were well known to the police and led a life that was the polar opposite to Christine Blood and Anne Carrier. Stephen Anderson, who was known as a Jekyll and Hyde character, was a keen bodybuilder who spent most of his days weightlifting. He was well known for being a troublemaker who enjoyed picking fights with people while out drinking. In fact, he'd been arrested on several occasions for assaults and wrecking bars. Uh, Donald Nielsen, aka the Black Panther, was a hero of uh, Stephen Anderson's. They both came from the same area, the West Riding area in, in Yorkshire. Anderson had even boasted that he met Nielsen in prison. Now, Coincidentally, um, one of Donald Nielsen's crimes, the murder of Leslie, uh, Leslie Whittle, um, took place just a few miles away where, from where Anderson and his companions would murder Anne Carrier and Elizabeth Blood. Paul Hebel was known as Spider-Man because of his long, thin legs. He was a violent thug and a skinhead football hooligan. He'd been banned from several local nightclubs for being aggressive and had a black belt in karate. He was also known in his local area as the Man in Black due to his insistence on only wearing black clothing. He was regularly seen driving around in his Ford Corsa, which he painted black, wearing dark shades. Philip Jennings, known as the most intelligent of the threesome and the brains behind the Bordy Barn murders, was a show-off. He was uh, very proud of his hard man image. He was a very talented bodybuilder and a national champion at 23 years old. Um, He had real potential and ambitions of joining the Olympic weightlifting team. Unfortunately, due to his flawed character, his dreams of becoming a successful weightlifter soon came to an end. Now, this is something that would leave him feeling very bitter with a grudge against society. He apparently used to boast that his job as a doorman at a local nightclub gave him plenty of opportunities to beat people up. Now, it was Philip Jennings' plan that led the free thugs to the boarded barn in Congleton on the 5th of November in 1979. Hell-bent on committing a crime they believed would make them rich beyond their wildest dreams. Jennings had read in a local paper a year before that supermarket magnate 
Alec Humphreys, who later became the director of Stoke City Football Club, had sold his chain of supermarkets for four million. He also read later that Humphreys had bought the boarded barn as a gift for his son Keith. They planned to kidnap members of the Humphreys family and ransom them for £50,000. Now on that fateful day in 1979, fired up on a cocktail of booze and amphetamines, the three thugs drove 60 miles across the country from their home in Huddersfield, Yorkshire, to the boarded barn in Congleton, wearing dark overalls, disguised with wigs, fake beards, and armed with two shotguns and a replica handgun. The boarded barn house had been owned by Anne Carrier's mother, who had recently passed away. The two ladies, who had been friends since their school days, had driven to the cottage separately to sort out her possessions. Not long after the ladies arrived that afternoon, the white Cortina, containing Philip Jennings, Paul Hebel and Stephen Anderson, drove down the gravel driveway of the boarded barn. They entered the barn and proceeded with their plan. Sadly for the two ladies... The three men had actually turned up at the wrong house and with no valuables to take, they proceeded with their shocking crime. The three tormented the two ladies, forcing them to dance naked for them. Elizabeth then had to watch with a loaded gun to her head as Anderson raped her best friend. The two women were then led away to separate rooms where they were bound to the bed and shot in the head through pillows with a sawn-off shotgun. Elizabeth Blood had also been shot in the neck and Anne Carrier was also shot twice in the small of the back. All three men participated in shooting the ladies so that they were all culpable of the crime. The macabre double murder that took place on that bonfire night that day would leave the police baffled and the country shocked. The naked bodies of the two wealthy ladies were found in separate bedrooms in the 16th century country cottage. They'd both been gagged. The murders were discovered by Anne's sister-in-law around 7.30pm after the ladies failed to turn up for a party that evening. The police, led by Superintendent Tom Brooks, launched a massive investigation, utilising 120 police officers in an attempt to track down the killers. Roadblocks were set up and every passing motorist was questioned by the police. Tracker dogs combed the countryside surrounding the cottage, searching for clues and weapons used in the attack. There appeared to be no motive in the brutal attack. The police originally thought that it was possibly a burglary which had gone wrong, as the house at one time had contained many antiques. It was found later, and for reasons only known to themselves that Stephen Anderson and Paul Hebel drove away from the property after the murders in Elizabeth Blood's dark blue Fiat estate car. They got as far as Newcastle on the line, about 10 miles away from the murder scene. They ditched the car on the forecourt of the Millhouse, Milehouse pub and restaurant and transferred to the white Cortina which Jennings was driving. The police soon found the car and witnesses were able to give the police descriptions of the two men seen exiting the car. But there, the trail soon ended. Now, in a lucky twist of fate, police were led 70 miles away to Huddersfield. Here, the police were investigating the theft of lead from a church roof. They'd actually stumbled upon a sawn-off shotgun, which was hidden beneath the bed of suspect David Anderson. The police officers noted that the shotgun looked like it had been used recently, David Anderson professed his innocence and told the police that he was looking after it for his brother Stephen. An arrest warrant was soon put out for Stephen Anderson. He was arrested about 24 hours later after a vigilant police officer saw him getting onto a bus in Huddersfield. After arresting Anderson, police searched his flat and soon found all they needed. In a drawer, they found cassette tapes containing radio and TV news recordings regarding the murders, as well as newspaper clippings. They also found the same make of shotgun cartridges used in the boarded barn murders. Faced with this evidence, Anderson admitted his part in the brutal crimes and also gave up his friends. In turn, this led to the arrest of Paul Hebel and Philip Jennings, and the three eventually admitted to hiring the Ford Cortina and driving to Scholar Green that day. At their trial, 
All three men were convicted and sentenced at Chester Crown Court to serve a minimum of 30 years for murder, aggravated burglary and rape. Stephen Anderson committed suicide within hours of his sentence at Risley Remand Centre by setting fire to his mattress in his cell and inhaling the fumes. Uh, the two remaining men, Philip Jennings and Paul Hebel, it's believed, would have been released from prison in 2010. The pair would have then been in their mid-50s and been able to enjoy many years of freedom, unlike the poor ladies who they brutally murdered on that chilling night. I'm very sure that these brutal crimes are going to be long remembered in the local area of Scholar Green. This was a senseless crime, and it was totally unnecessary. Um, a totally harebrained plan by Philip Jennings. Poorly planned, poorly executed. Um, it was so poorly planned that it was doomed to fail right from the start. Um, they basically drove 60 miles from their home, turned up at the wrong house, and the, the Humphreys family were not at the body barn, and unfortunately for Anne Carrier and Elizabeth Blood, they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, to treat these women so appallingly and kill them in such a brutal manner was totally unnecessary. And the, the killer's behaviour was very questionable the whole way through this crime. You know, they, they apparently at one point at the body barn one of them revealed the first name of one of the culprits by accident. Um, and then he went on to humiliate these these poor ladies, making them strip naked, making them dance. Uh, Anne Carrier was raped by Stephen Anderson. And then they decided to drive away from the property um, in Elizabeth Blood's car and left it at the Mile House pub where witnesses would, were able to give the police descriptions of Anderson and Hebel. And then, furthermore, Stephen Anderson decided to keep incriminating evidence le linking him to the murders. Now, Philip Jennings, while he was being questioned by the police, um, tried to suggest that he was hard done by. Um, apparently, he said, they are all the same, these high society people. They have money and everything and can do no wrong. It's always the little people like me that are wrong. So, I mean... I mean, this shows just how callous they were, really. Um, and quite clearly, they they felt hard done by and felt like the world owed them something, had a sense of entitlement. And um, they, they basically murdered these two ladies for nothing, really. Um, you know, they, they, they murdered two very decent members of society because they didn't want to lose face with one another, which is just a, a ridiculous way. A, a ridiculous reason why two very nice people had to die. Um, both Paul Hebel and Philip Jennings, I believe, will likely be free now. Um, I haven't been able to find anything out about them since. Um, I did speak to ex-detective superintendent Bob Bridstock, who worked on the case. Um, Bob and his wife, Carol, are both authors now, and they actually wrote... A fictional account of the um, the Bordy Barnes murders, which was shown on the TV series Written in Blood. I did speak with Bob briefly via email, and he got back to me, and he said he recalls that both Hebel and Jennings were questioned about other crimes while they were in prison, but they refused to talk. And he he also added to that that he was unaware of what they were about, so what whatever happened to them after they left prison. So. I mean, it's quite a frightening thought, really, that two vicious, cold, callous killers like Hebel and Jennings are probably walking amongst us now as free people today. I mean, my, my opinion is people who commit sadistic crimes like that should be locked up and never let, uh, never let out again. But um, we all know that the, um, the British justice system is, uh, is far too lenient with its sentences for violent criminals. Well... That's that's it for the show today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always, please like, subscribe and share the channel. It's greatly appreciated. Um, next up, what I'll be doing, I'll be doing an interview with Ryan Daly. Now, if you listened to me, Lisa Hessian podcast last time, you would have heard me mention Ryan's name. Ryan's from my hometown in Lee and he runs the Facebook group 
Um, let's get justice for Lisa Jane Hessian and her mum, Christine. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to have Ryan on. I'm going to have a little chat about uh, Lisa's case and uh, we'll have a chat about his Facebook group uh, as well. Now, going forward with the podcast, I'm going to be mainly in the future concentrating on on unsolved crimes because it's something I feel passionate about. Um, and I, I want to invest my energy, my energy in unsolved crimes and raising their profile. So I'll, there'll be more about that after I've interviewed um, Ryan Daly, uh, which will be coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. Now, just before we go, I'd also like to thank my partner, Amanda, for helping me research the Bordy Barn murders. Amanda wrote a blog a while back on the case, uh, which is on my True Crime page podcast blog. So what I'll do when the show's up on YouTube later, I'll put the the link for the blog in the information below on the YouTube video. So be sure to go and check that out. Give it a read. Right. That's it for now, folks. Um, I hope you have a great week ahead. Take care of yourselves. And until next time, I'll see you soon. <laughs>